We're going to go straight into the session with Lee Scott, who is the manager of sales and business development at Element 5. He's going to be given, going through a session on market analysis and manufacturing perspective for Mass Timber. And we're also so appreciative to him and to Element 5 for being the industry, industry partner for the conference this year. And we're really excited to hear what you have to say. Over to you, Lee. Awesome. You guys hear me okay? Uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking around on a, on a Friday afternoon. As, as, uh, as you said, my name is Lee Scott. I manage sales and business development at Element 5. Just wanted to start off by, by giving a little background on, on Element 5. So Element 5 has, uh, has actually been in business since about 2015. We started off as uh, a company that the business model was actually to bring in material from Europe. Uh, we wanted to build a team and a portfolio and all of the tools that are necessary in order to, to make these mass timber projects come to fruition. Um, so we actually did about 40 projects of, of small to medium scale using European supply. Uh, we then switched our business model because the overall, overall objective goal was to, to open up this, this beautiful factory that we now have in St. Thomas, Ontario. So in 2019, we broke ground on this 140,000 square foot facility and actually it, it actually came together extremely fast. Within 13 months, we were pressing panels. So November 19, 2019 to December 2020, uh, we started pressing our first panel. And by April 1st, 2021, we were fully certified to sell CLT and glue lamb in North America. So CLT certification is PRG 320. You've got to make a bunch of panels and break them and burn them and bend them and send it off for testing in order to actually be able to sell a certified product. So we've actually got this 140,000 square foot facility with two automated lines. Um, the line, uh, the equipment we use is by Ledneck. So it's a company from Slovenia. They do these high-end turnkey um, CLT and glue lamp facilities all around the world. It's a very evolved and well-respected line. We actually had the Slovenians come in and live in London, Ontario for the year that the, pro uh, that the plant was being erected. Um, I think they may even have taken a couple of London girls back to Slovenia with them. <laughs> Uh, but they still come back and check on the plant. And we've actually, I just announced yesterday, some exciting news that we're actually expanding the plant already. So we're bumping it out by 50%, adding 70,000 square feet. That's just phase one of our two-part development uh, for expansion. We're going to be adding increased CNC capacity. As you see, the market here is exploding. It's great to see the, uh, the level of excitement in the industry. And the fact that you guys are here with me at 4 o'clock on a, on a Friday afternoon uh, really shows the commitment. So I appreciate it. Um, Big question is why, why is all the excitement about mass timber? So I'm, for me, I'm, I'm in sales, so I have to you know, find, the, find ways to extract the maximum value out of mass timber projects to make them go forward. As we know, mass timber is, 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 is a premium material, but I think when you extrapolate all the value that you can out of the product, it can actually be quite cost competitive and even cheaper than, than some of the conventional alternatives. So today here, we've seen a lot of beautiful buildings throughout the past um, presenters. And a lot of those buildings have some really extreme features, which are great architecturally and beautiful. But for me, in order to get projects to pencil in, especially in today's market uh, with high interest rates and you know, hard to get capital, we really need to build these buildings efficiently. So we're going to walk through a couple of reasons, you know, what the value is and then you know, different building typologies on how to get that and then some manufacturing aspects on how to actually keep costs down. So one of the most obvious reasons and benefits of mass timber is just the look of it, right? The aesthetics, so, you know, the buzzword is biophilic benefits. And I think just looking at some of these photos, it's, you know, it's, it's a no brainer that these buildings are beautiful aesthetically, but using mass timber as the actual finished material is, is, is really great value proposition for, for using less of other materials, having less trades on site and able to get these buildings occupied faster and maybe get a higher return of, uh, return of um, investment uh, on, on the properties themselves. So here's an example of a fire hall we've done. Mass, mass timber is quite a dynamic product um, in the fact that we're doing everything from you know, a single family house all the way to there's a 31 story office building in Milwaukee. You're gonna be right next to the tallest building in the world, which is a 25 story apartment building currently in Milwaukee, but it really shows um, how dynamic the product is. Looks beautiful on this fire hall that we did in Port Stanley. We're also doing affordable housing. If you were here on Wednesday night, you saw the panel on affordable housing. We're really proud to have this. Um, this is the first of many affordable housing buildings that we've done in, uh, in, in Mass Timber. David Moses just, uh, just showed a few photos on it. But we were able to leave uh, quite a bit of the timber exposed on this one. But we actually did a lot of in-house testing with acoustics, 
uh, in order to leave more exposed on the next one. So we had to be a little bit con conservative on exposing timber on this one. You can see there on the photo on the, uh, on the left that the exterior facade is covered up in drywall. Every second unit on this one, we had to checkerboard it. So on the next unit over, the facade, the interior of the exterior wall, the interior face of the exterior wall envelope was exposed and the ceiling was covered. So we had to do this checkerboard effect. Um, since then, we've done in-house testing or in-field testing, pardon me, uh, to actually expose more of that. So on, on subsequent buildings, we've actually been able to expose all of the timber. Um, and you can see here exposed stairwells in the middle uh, in the middle picture there and ex exposed canopy. You'll notice we went to a Douglas fir for the columns where they're exposed because they hold up to the weather conditions a little bit better. So making smart choices on your species is, is, a, is a really smart thing to do early on. This is a building that we're doing with the same typology. It's six stories. Um, it's passive house. So we're utilizing um, some of the, you know, the thermal preferments of, of mass timber for the exterior wall envelope. We're getting a high performance wall envelope that helps achieve their passive house standards. And we've gone to six stories with this typology. It's the same team, Edge Architects, Malul Blamey is the GC, uh, same structural engineer of record. Element 5 is doing actually um, most of the mass timber engineering on these projects. Uh, but as more and more um, knowledge is passed to, to local engineers, you know, we hope to, as, as Patrick Crabb said in his presentation, do less of that delegated design and just actually manufacture more product. So this is a really cool building that's going to be actually going up in Hamilton, the city of Hamilton housing, uh, later this fall. We just completed the Enbridge Operations Center. Enbridge Oil and Gas Company wanted to have, you know, utilize the sustainability prop, um, properties of mass timber. Plus, they got a gorgeous looking building in Ottawa. Uh, you can see here some of the interior shots. It's an operations center, so you had some high double, double story columns, beautiful post and beam design. We integrated steel brace frames to resolve some of the lateral forces. Uh, so Element 5 did a lot of the engineering with Walter Fetty. This, this building turned out amazing and, and Enbridge is very happy. They're doing two more here in, in Toronto area uh, starting up soon. You've got Audi Canada who um, wanted to utilize some sustainability benefits of utilizing mass timber in their EV charging station. So if you're driving down the QEW, you'll see, you'll see this EV charging station that's just completed earlier this year uh, with these beautiful glue lamb um, structure integrated with the solar panels and, the, and a steel um, support structure. So a bit of a hybrid. Perhaps one of the most tangible benefits of mass timber is the construction schedule. Uh, so on average, these buildings go together. I mean. On average, I would say, you know, we might have some, some issues here and there because it's a new industry. But on average, if we can do these buildings 25 to 30% faster than a cast in place concrete building, that has a huge, huge benefit. So the buildings are lighter, which is another benefit, but that means you're using less concrete. You have less soil remediation. We can fabricate the building in our factory, which is just two hours down the road from, the, from Toronto here. Uh, we can fabricate that building at the exact same time that the foundations are done. So when the concrete work is done, we can start a just-in-time delivery process to site. And we can actually, as you saw, prefabricate the building envelope. All of the MEP uh, penetrations are cut in our factory, which allows fewer decisions to be made on site, fewer change orders, fewer site instructions, uh, fewer, more cost certainty for the owner. And when the trades are on site, as opposed to making decisions and, you know, oh, this is going here, all oh, that hits that pipe, we got to make a change here, better put out an RFI. There's less paperwork, less bureaucracy, things go together faster on site. I mean, that is a huge benefit if it's done well. Uh, you got to work with good consultants because we've seen that MEP coordination can grind a project schedule to a halt. So MEP has to be very well coordinated, but if it is, it's a huge benefit. But it can also be a challenge, so just, just something to be very wary of. Um, and interior finishes, we talked about leaving as much exposed timber as possible on these buildings. All of that overall, you know, you're extracting a lot of value if these projects are done well. And I've just got a short video here uh, on the installation of the 41 unit women's shelter that we did in Kitchener. So this building was about 25,000 square feet. It's not gonna play for me. So I don't have to click it or... There we go, touch screen. So this building was about, yeah, like I said, 25,000 square feet, 41 uh, unit women's shelter for the YWCA. Uh, it went up in just, I think it was 18 or 19 days. It's a full mass timber uh, structural approach. So we have CLT unit demising walls, uh, CLT floor slabs, CLT stair and elevator cores, CLT roof. This entire building is basically a CLT. Not a lot of glue lamb on, on the project, but that allowed for a rapid install. 
And I think even the GC, this was their first mass timber building, was a little blown away about how fast, clean, and precise these projects go together. Uh, so they probably could have got the MEP trades in there a little bit quicker um, to, to finish out and fit out the building. On this building, you'll see we put on our mass timber envelope system. So Element 5 has what's called our CLIP system. This is part of the Rapid Housing Initiative, and we actually didn't have enough time to design the full CLIP system off-site. So they actually ended up putting on the rest of the envelope system on-site. Uh, but you can see here the four-story tilt-up panels that we did with the windows pre-punched and just how fast that went on. I think the entire envelope went on in under two days. So pretty amazing. We actually put an, an identical sister building. Well, that wasn't identical. Sorry, it was three stories. That one went up in 10 days. It's right next door. So very cool. We've, we've uh, completed another one in North York, sorry, in East Willenberry, and we have several other under, uh, under design and going into construction this fall. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the different types of construction. You saw an all CLT wall solution there. Um, in Ontario, we're allowed to go to 12 stories now, but it's the design you pick is very important early on um, based on the fire rating. It's gonna impact your structural grid, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But one of the most obvious and conventional uh, solutions here is a post and beam solution. So this is a building that we did in, uh, in Laval. It's, uh, I think it was a 50,000 square foot post and beam structure. It's called code 440. Um, but you really wanna be conscious of your lateral system. If you're using CLT and glue lamb as a post and beam, you wanna understand what is your lateral? Are you gonna use CLT cores? Are you gonna use concrete cores? And that really is dependent on the height of the building. Are you gonna need additional CLT shear walls? Or are you gonna use uh, um, steel brace frames? Are you gonna integrate other materials? A lot of those decisions are gonna to have to come very early in the design process. And that's why we, we come on as a design assist partner very early on, on I would say almost 80% of our projects now, we come on in schematic design or, or design development as a design assist partner to help make these decisions because they can be absolutely crucial to whether that project is going to pencil out. If you come in and, and talk to us, um, you know, at 50% CDs, all of these decisions are already so hard corded into the design. It's very hard to make those changes, which could have resulted in, in hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, millions of dollars in savings, depending on the project size. And you got to know where you're building this project and what the local code is. So this is our project in New York City. It's, it's just topped out uh, this week, actually. So it's 122 Waverly. It's at the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yards. It's five-story post and beam. Uh, we would have done CLT cores on there, but New York City didn't allow for this. New York City just adopted the code to allow for um, CLT construction just in November of last year. So this is the first actually fully approved CLT project. It's not the first CLT project, but the first one wasn't actually approved. Um, they had some issues with the, the fire department. Um, so yeah, so um, just knowing the, the local code and, and how you're gonna resolve those lateral forces really makes a big um, impact on, on, your, on your structural design. This is a beautiful design by Jason Korb, uh, Korb Associates out of uh, Milwaukee. This is actually in Muskegon Lake, just north of Chicago on the, on the Michigan side. Um, Corb did, did also did the Ascent Tower. So this one is actually going into our factory production, um, I, think, I think in the next couple of weeks. They're just finishing out a little bit of MEP coordination, uh, which is typical for some of these jobs. But uh, beautiful building going to Michigan. Michigan is really actually exploding in the mass timber world right now. And this one we're really proud of. Um, this is a 243,000 square foot distribution center. So commercial, industrial, I believe this is going to be the first full mass timber commercial industrial building in North America. So Prologis is really leading the way in, in bringing this into the industrial space. And they are doing this you know, for a lot of sustainability reasons. They wanna be net zero by 2030. It's part of their overall corporate, corporate goals and their ESG goals and mass timber is helping immensely with that. So this is gonna be one of their flagship buildings going, going up in Brampton. Uh, we're working with Aspect and Gravity Engineering on this. It's moving full steam ahead, and we hope to be on site uh, early next year. So another, another methodology is, is point supported. Uh, this is the famous Brock Commons building. You'll notice on this building, if you're not familiar with point supported, that the column grid is a little tighter. You've got, a, you've got more columns, but you're utilizing the two-way spanning action of CLT. And what that does is it equals more columns, but it equals zero beams. So this is, you know, it's post and plate or point supported. Um, so in, in jurisdictions like, you know, the GTA, where you have these um, design criteria of like a wedding cake step back design, point supported can be a solution that allows you to have your column grid straight up and down. Sometimes step backs inhibit and they create load transfers. 
uh, which are really cost prohibitive on a mass timber project. So having your columns straight up and down and your load paths straight up and down is really important to mitigate um, cost increases. So having a point supported solution, this is a, a design that Aspect had done on a building we were looking at here in the GTA. There hasn't been, I would say, a lot of, a lot of uh, point supported systems done, but I think there's a lot of potential there um, in the future. This is the uh, one we've already talked about, full mass timber, or sorry, full CLT wall solution. So it's a little bit more uh, fiber overall, but the install of these projects is so rapid that sometimes you can hit an inflection point where the, the benefit of the rapid install and getting that building occupied and, and hitting a construction schedule outweighs a little bit of the extra material. And also, um, yeah, the, 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 the CLT acts as shear walls and all those unit demising walls, so it has some, uh, some benefits for the lateral system as well. This is a system I really like and we have had great success with recently. Um, CLT hybrid with a light wood frame walls and a CLT uh, deck. So as you've seen in some of the other presentations, I think it was, it was either Franco or, um, or Craig th this morning that said 70% of your mass of mass timber, of your volume of mass timber ends up in your floor plate. So you're still getting a lot of the sustainability benefits of, of mass timber by having the floor plate and you can actually prefabricate these stud walls to, to still get the rapid install. If it's designed well, we can have 10 foot wide by 40 foot long or 45, whatever the grid is, uh, CLT panels. So you're putting up 400 square feet of floor plate every 15 or 20 minutes with a crane. So a good crew can put up 10 to 15,000 square feet of floor plate per day with, with this typology. Um, so we're seeing this pencil out because typically the vertical structure having a solid CLT four inch thick CLT wall can be cost prohibitive and having glue lamb post and beam glue lamb is about twice as expensive as CLT per volume unit rate. So switching that out for, for a hybrid solution can really help projects become economical and pencil in. I really love this solution. We've picked up a few hundred thousand square feet of work recently with this. We've completed a project in Kitchener using this. This is a six story building. The first one the developer has done, uh, it's on Franklin Avenue in Waterloo. It's 10,000 square feet per floor plate. They left the roof as, as conventional joists. When they got to the roof, because they wanted a data point, because we're doing four buildings on, the, on this intersection, they left the roof as, op as, as conventional joists. It took them two weeks to put on the roof. Every other floor went on in one day and they buttoned up the connections in the next day. So two days compared to two weeks, even on a 60,000 square foot building, that equaled weeks of savings. They had concrete cores on this building. Next building, they're doing CLT cores, as much CLT as they can. So the developers fully bought in. We're having the next building on site at the end of this month. So huge success. We're doing three more with this developer and he's already designing the next ones. Again, light wood frame hybrid. We just picked up four buildings in Golden, Colorado. It's about 250 to 300,000 square feet. Uh, the buildings are almost identical. So you're utilizing repeatability, rinse and repeat. The floor plates are, are identical. We're maximizing the panelization because we got in early in SD with the, uh, with the structural engineer and the developer and the architect so that we can maximize element five's panel sizes. Very important for, for shipping, logist, for uh, shipping and install and to maximize our throughput in the factory. So getting in early and, and utilizing your manufacturer. Another typology I like, similar to lightwood frame, but steel hybrid. So this is a technical school we're doing in Kalamazoo, Michigan right now. It's about 160,000 square feet with DLR architects and IMEG engineering. Uh, this is basically putting a CLT deck on, on steel I-beams. So it's um, utilizing the steel for where its structural capacity makes sense and utilizing CLT for the visual, beautiful underside of, underside of the ceiling. Still getting the sustainability benefits, but, but really taking advantage of both materials. Uh, so great typology. I'm seeing this go like the new Cornell University in Ithaca is this typology. There's a bunch of data centers going in the United States right now with this typology. We're doing that. Like, this, this is really taking off as well. And all of these buildings are going to end up being some sort of concrete hybrid. They're going to have concrete foundations. But I would say, and I, I mean, it's a little bit of opinion based, but above six stories, you're probably going to switch to a concrete core. I'd say six stories and below, we can easily do a mass timber uh, core and lateral system, uh, maybe mixed with steel brace frames, but um, having one material typology for the whole project and construction sequence really eliminates a lot of coordination and integration with the different materials. But when you get above, above six stories, the, the, you know, the lateral force resisting system usually indicates you're gonna go to a concrete or, or, or another material, um, which is fine. 
So probably one of the most important ways to make a mass timber project pencil in is the structural grid. So, and this is usually defined very early in a project. So the structural grid is by far the most important part, in my opinion, of making a project uh, viable. So we get projects from architects all the time that are, you know, they've gone down a path and their grid is 6.5 meters and it just doesn't work well with CLT, right? If, if a building is six stories and below in Ontario, it typically has a one hour fire rating and I can, I can do get a one hour fire rating with a, with my most optimized five ply panel. So it's 175 millimeters thick. You get a one hour fire rating out of that inherently at six meters, about 20 feet. If I'm double spanning to continuously spanning over two bays, if it's 6.3 meters, I've got to up, up the volume or I've got to put a, a, a pearl in or, you know, a, a column down the middle of the bay. So keeping it within the design constraints, uh, keeps the volume of wood and the, what defines an effective mass timber project is your ratio of volume of wood per square foot. Keeping that as low as possible is going to keep make projects go ahead. I know the last slide on these presentations says more wood equals less CSO or less less CO2, but it should really say more wood buildings because more wood in a building is actually probably going to make it cost prohibitive. We're trying to keep the volume of wood as minimal as possible because typically about 60 to 70% of our costs as a manufacturer and of these buildings is the fiber itself. Most other conventional construction, it's the labor, the time on site, all of that, that, that drives cost. the material's cheap. So concrete is cheaper than mass timber. There's, there's no secret there. But if, you, um, if you're extracting all of the value that, that we've talked about, keeping the volume of wood down, that's where that tipping point is. And we're gonna put up a building with five guys and a crane, as opposed to a concrete building that has formwork and rebar and you know tons of trades on site. So it, it's a, just a different way of thinking, but the structural grid, you need to consider the strength of the CLT, what species it is. We work with SPF, because that's our regional fiber uh, bread, uh, wood basket. If you're in the US, Southern US, you're, you're working with Southern Yellow Pine. If you're on the West Coast, you're probably working with Douglas Fir. They all have different design constraints. Um, we all have different span tables. So know who your manufacturer is, know, know who you want to work with, design your structural grid, and then design the architecture around that. That is the best way to make projects uh, pencil in. So you can see here, also just one little tidbit is um, have an even number of bays. If I'm two span continuously over, over two bays, if I have an odd bay at the end, that means that I can only, that I have to simply support um, for one bay. And if I'm simply supporting, I get about 20 to 30% less structural spanning capacity out of that panel. If you're double spanning, continuous span, you get a negative bending moment and you get, uh, you can span 6.1 meters. If I'm just a simple, simply supported span, I'm only spanning 5.2 meters. So having an even number of bays and being able to utilize uh, two span continuous for each, uh, for each bay is really critical. Now, if you go to two hour fire rating, so if you go from six stories to seven stories in Ontario, it's a big deal. Like uh, the developer might say, hey, I'm gonna increase my performa and get more, more, more units and more doors. Uh, I'm just gonna go to seven stories, but that completely changes your entire structural design. Um, now, now if I wanna use a five ply at two hour fire rating and leave it exposed, I've gotta decrease my structural span to about 18 feet and to hit that two hour fire rating, or I need to go up to a seven ply panel. And if I go from 175 millimeters to 245 millimeters, I just increased my volume of wood by nearly 40%. That project's probably not going to pencil any longer. So you got to understand your fire rating, your acoustic rating, your structural grid. These are key to make it work. And then understand your assemblies. So on the, on the left there, you've got um, a standard one hour fire rating, five ply CLT panel. You've got a 10 to 15 millimeter uh, acoustic genie mat by Plytech. Likely most of our projects have been using a, the Plytech genie mat. And you've got it between an inch and a half to three inch concrete topping, depending on what you're going for. Uh, and then your finished floor uh, assembly. If you want to expose an elevator shaft, um, you're probably going to need a five ply panel to hit your one hour fire rating. And then you're going to have uh, a finished assembly on the other side. And if you're using CLT as a partition wall, you want to use the minimum fiber and you're going to fur out both sides of the wall for fire and acoustics. So those are some, some typical details that we work with. I'm doing on time here. Uh, waste is, is a huge factor for us. So we have, we have programmers, you know, writing algorithms to, to minimize waste. And every project that we do, we run through these programs in order to take, uh, try to absolutely reduce the amount of waste. So we make rectangles. We're pretty constrained on shapes here at Element 5. And most people in the mass timber industry are in the rectangle business. 
Uh, there's some cool guys making curved glue lamb out there, but for as far as CLT goes, all, all producers are making rectangles. You can see when we make a raw billet, you've got glue, you've got glue pouring out the edges. So the bigger the panel we can make, the less perimeter cutting we have to do. If I can do a project in 50 panels as opposed to 60, that means less waste because I have to cut half an inch off the entire perimeter every time I, every time I make a billet. Um, so less panels, bigger panels equals less waste, more sustainability. And then you've got to make some decisions. So for this envelope system, there was two ways to do this envelope uh, for this um, four-story building. We ended up going with the with the tilt up just for speed of construction, but that means we had to punch, we had to make a rectangle and then punch a big uh, hole in it. We can only have so many coffee tables made out of CLT. Uh, if anybody wants one, I've got them for sale on eBay. But the other option would be to actually panelize it and make lintels and, and add connections, but that adds factory time, it adds steel connections, it adds engineering. Uh, so we went with the fast, but you have to make those decisions for more, a little bit more waste, but faster install. And you, you have to understand those decisions early on. So also understanding what your, what your manufacturer can do in terms of prefabrication. The more we can do offsite typically equals less time and money on site and less mistakes on site. It's always sunny in the factory that never rains in the factory. We can do stuff really well there. So, and, and typically labor is cheaper in a factory than it is on site and especially in a, in a big city uh, like New York or Toronto. So we wanna prefabricate as much of these connections as possible in our factory and making sure that there's no scope gap between what your installer is doing and what we're doing in the factory. Sometimes it's like, oh, you get to site, it's like, oh, I thought you were prefabbing that in the factory. It's like, no, I thought you were doing that on site. Um, so just re really clear communication between the, the install team and the, and the manufacturer, but typically doing as much prefab on, in the factory as possible is gonna save time and money on site and help the schedule um, so at element five, I mean, we're, we're no uh, stranger to prefabrication. We'll put on membranes, we'll prefab connections. We also have what's called our CLIP system. It's called, stands for cross laminated insulated panel. So we've done this on several projects right now. Uh, it utilizes CLT as the backing of the envelope system. We'll put, a, this is a typical assembly, it varies, but you can put a, a, a air vapor barrier. So a peel and stick membrane on it as the air vapor barrier. And then typically a rigid insulation. Somebody earlier mentioned Gutex. That's a great sustainable product. What we typically use though, because of code, because they need non-combustible is a, is a Rockwell comfort board. It has to be a rigid or a semi-rigid insulation. We'll put some wood strapping and then the cladding attachment and cladding will be done on site. We have done a fully unitized panel in our factory uh, as a mock-up, which has, which has the window and cladding on it already. Uh, we did that for a design competition, uh, which we did very well on for the Canada Earth Tower. Uh, we're, we're putting more and more R&D to be able to deliver fully unitized panels with cladding and windows. Not quite there yet. Um, on the Trinity College project downtown Toronto, so we saw the, the Gold Ring Tower, the 14-story one in, in uh, David's presentation. Right next door at the same time, we're going to be building Trinity College. There's going to be a lot of mass timber going up at U of T uh, starting in November and this is a 247 bed student residence. We are putting that clip system on this project. I believe it's gonna be one of the first in North America. We're bringing, and you can see that there's, there's masonry on this, on this project as the, as the finished envelope. We're bringing the CLT, the air vapor barrier, the eight inches of Rockwell insulation because we're getting an R40 effective assembly and the brick ties prefab from our factory brought to site and so they're just putting the brick and the and the masonry, or sorry, they're just putting the brick and the windows on on site. That's going to save huge time. Uh, it's going to save huge disru dis disruption at U of T for students and, and everybody. Downtown Toronto traffic, trades. So they really saw the benefit in this. Um, we're hoping it goes well. But uh, yeah, it, it's a, it's a super cool application for this project. And and we really hope to to get that unitized system and put it on concrete and steel buildings too, because with Toronto Green Standard and the need for a high performance envelope, we're gonna to start to see uh, a lot more wood and CLT envelopes, I think. It's not for every project, it's gotta be repeatable, but I think it's pretty cool. So at Element 5, I mean, we're, we're a full service shop. I manage sales, so I deal with cost consulting, and design consulting. Any of you have a project that you're considering mass timber, shoot it over my way. I will give you some blunt feedback. I will give you some budget pricing, try to steer you in the right direction, You know, link you in with some great consultants. A lot of them you've seen here today that, that can help move your project forward. Uh, we can come on as a design assist for a very nominal fee to help work with the, the project team in order to get it to a place where we can give a, 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 an accurate budget price and be bought on it as a supply partner. If the, if the project doesn't get there, that's why I keep my design assist fee very low. 
Uh, we want to see projects go ahead. We want to see wood go through our factory. We want to see beautiful buildings here in North America. So we're here to help. We have the, we have the factory, we have the capability. Uh, we help the installer. We have preferred installers that we work with all across North America. We don't do the ins install in-house ourselves. We can take on the contract sometimes, but uh, typically we work um, with the GC who hires both of us. Just a little bit about the process. I'm probably running a little bit late here. Um, there's always at least three steps of process here. No matter where we come on, whether it's schematic design, design development, or construction documents, there's gonna be design and engineering coordination. We typically have uh, delegated um, engineering design to do. And no matter, even if they're 100% CDs, I guarantee you there's a few weeks of coordination to do with MEP in order to get it to a place where we can do our shop drawings. So there's an extra step compared to conventional construction here. There's, there's always delegated design, there's always coordination to do with MEP in order to get to us to a place where we have all of our, our questions answered so we can start doing our 3D modeling and shop drawings. We're gonna do those 3D model, we're gonna take it to an LOD 400, we're gonna issue our, our IFA, our issued for approval set, you're going to look at that. The consultants are going to look at that. Building department is going to look at that. They're going to approve that as noted. They're going to, you know, revise and resubmit, whatever it is. Once we have those approvals and they're fully finalized, that's when we can manufacture and procure, um, procure stuff. So not until then. So there's the construction schedule. There's a lot of, a lot of misconceptions about construction schedules. Like, oh, you won the job here. When can I have your shop drawings in two weeks? It doesn't work like that. There's coordination. There's approvals. There's modeling. There's a lot of steps. The reason that these buildings go together so quickly on site is because they're detailed down to the last screw. Um, and that takes time and it takes effort. So we do a lot of that in house. We have, I think 10 engineers, structural engineers on staff now. We have architects, 3D modelers. We do a lot of this stuff to streamline it in house, but we work with consultants. It's a big bottleneck for us to do every project and manufacture, or sorry, to, to uh, facilitate the shop drawings and engineering on every project. So we need more partners in the, in the industry that can bring us fully fully bedded models to, to, to fabricate so we can hit our, our capacity. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that we can do to streamline processes. So getting in early is, is really key. Early engagement, can't stress it enough. Bring me a napkin. That project in New York, I started working with the architect literally on a napkin sketch when we were in a coffee shop in Brooklyn. And now it's being constructed. Pretty cool. I'm really proud of that. Um, but just nailing down that grid and understanding your constraints early, working with the AHJ, um, you know, understanding the, the codes. It, it's And then for us, our, we're becoming busier and busier. If we can be engaged earlier, we can start planning for your project in the factory. If you come to me with an LOD 400 model and you want draw, you want stuff in six weeks. I mean, we're, we're booked out until, until Q2 next year, but we can work with you early on in order to um, hit your schedule. If, if we're working from, if, if we're, if we're, we're aiming for a milestone schedule and we're, we understand uh, the deliverables early on, we also want to help design out the complexity uh, early on. So earlier you can, you can give me a call the better. So that's it. Take some questions. Thank you for your time. Any questions from the audience? Uh, have you ever seen any hybrid using ICF? Using what, sorry? ICF. Uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've ex explored that a little bit. I don't think we specifically have, have used ICF. Um, but yeah, no, definitely probably a possibility for, for foundations. Yeah. Just on that uh, lightwood frame typology you showed up there. Yeah. Am I, done, am I assuming or understanding this right, that in that situation, the lightwood framing takes place of your, your column grids? Correct, yeah, the lightwood frame would act as a load-bearing wall. Yeah, and yeah. then with that, is there additional encapsulation that has to happen? So with it depends on the fire rating and the grid, but for that project specifically, we did infield testing. So the first one, the, the, the design, we didn't. We hadn't done the infill testing, so there was some encapsulation on that project. The next one is going to be basically fully exposed. We're uh, utilizing um, Simon Edwards at HCC Engineering, Acoustic Engineering there, and uh, we, the infill testing we did showed that when you have the concrete topping on that assembly, it gave enough mass and dampening to hit your STC and your IIC ratings without the drywall and encapsulation. So the walls are encapsulated, obviously, because they're, they're stick frame. Um, but now we're able to leave on the next projects those ceilings fully exposed on both sides of the units, which was a huge game changer. Because if you have to break the panel at every unit demising wall, it doubles your crane picks, doubles your connections. I mean, it's a butterfly effect and you don't get the, the grid that you need, right? 
So if you're double spanning, you can hit, you can do 6.17 meters with a V2 five ply panel, and that's an optimized cost effective panel. If you um, if you if you can't do that, then you're going to a seven ply, and like I said, you're adding so much volume. So there are some acoustic strips that do go on top of the load bearing wall, but they're fairly inexpensive as as opposed to uh, the other other avenues. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, hi, Lee. Thanks for your presentation. Oh, there um, <laughs> So I think the the walls that you're proposing, especially for the UFT project, they're really impressive. How how did you get that through the planning department? Did you did your walls go through some kind of ULC or UL testing? And how yep. would you and if they didn't, how would you convince the planning department to approve that through building permit? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, we work with uh, RDH Building Science Group on on that. Uh, it's definitely an alternative solution at, at this point. It's a it's an engin engineered solution, um, you know, involving the AHJ and the and the building department uh, on that. We've effectively done that on, on a few projects. This will be the largest one, but yeah, right now it is not like a, a standardized product uh, that has been UL tested. It's um uh it's an engineered solution and an alternative solution through the building department. So then, I guess maybe sort of follow that strategy in getting those authorities in, in on it early and saying these are the walls we're going with yeah and then provide asps for, for or engineering judgments for each wall and floor exactly it's a process and when you go through an alternative solution you definitely want to involve the ahj as early as possible and make them feel a part of the solution right you want to help them feel a part of the design process you don't want to you know just throw a, a building permit at or you know building permit set at them and they've never seen it before so uh, you know, that's a key to success is just early involvement and engagement and, uh, and working with the, the AHJ. And that, and, that, and that project's been approved or it's in the process? Yeah, that project is under, under fabrication and it's going to be on site in November. So Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Up in the corner? For, uh, for four to six story residential, yeah. can you speak to why you want to use the hybrid versus why you want to use CLT? Like, what are some of the so, Well, I always want to use CLT as the floor system. Uh, when I go to a hybrid above six stories, it's typically to replace glue lamb because, like I said, glue lamb is is fairly ex like uh, per volume the the, the volume rate met, uh, the the unit rate for glue lamb is is almost double CLT, and when you get above six stories, your your base column is taking such a load that and if you're exposing it at a two hour fire rating, you're getting a very large section of glue lamb right. So it's just sheer volume of wood and the unit rate cost of glue lamb uh, really makes it. I would say attractive to switch out to like an HSS column or steel column or some sort of other vertical system. Uh, it's beautiful if you can get a 12 story building to go all mass timber. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, encapsulating the glue lamb or exposing the glue lamb makes a big difference whether you're trying to hit that two hour fire rating because it does increase the section quite a bit um, and add, add costs and, and reduce floor space. But if you can get your performer to work with an all mass timber solution, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Right. Um, but also you can, you can, you can swap out steel and glue lamb. If you want to have a beautiful glue lamb column in the, in a, in an architecturally attractive area, like a, like a lobby or in the middle of a, a large condo unit, um, you can, and then if, but if you're going to have a steel beam hit it in a wall or like a, a glue lamb column hit it in a wall or a beam hit it in a wall, maybe just switch that to steel because it's encapsulated anyway. It's going to be hidden anyway. You can, you can have some savings there and they're, they're quite interchangeable because of the tolerances are similar. Any other questions? Lee, Great. thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it.